Hello, I hope everybody's doing well. So this is part of uh, what I'm doing for supporters of AA Beyond Belief on Patreon and also members of our YouTube channel. This is ex exclusive content just for you. And what I'm doing is I am basically going through the traditions, one tradition a week, reading from the 12 and 12 and stopping at places to comment. So what I'm saying here on this video is only my understanding of the tradition as it as my understanding is today. Uh, and you might have a completely different understanding and I would welcome you to comment about the tradition and let me know how you feel about it. Um, you can do that either through the comments on Patreon just below the video or in YouTube and the members only section on YouTube. So again, this is exclusive for members of YouTube and uh, patrons, and no one else will see the comments. It'll be completely private in that sense. So tradition two reads as follows. For our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are, not, are but trusted servants. They do not govern. So immediately as an atheist, the problem I'm going to have with this is the loving God bit. But as it turns out, as in all of the um, literature in Alcoholics Anonymous, you can scratch out the God part and the tradition or whatever the step will apply, because really this is a practical uh, thing here. What we're talking about is the group decides what it's going to do. It's the group conscience that informs the uh, trusted servants of the group what they should do on behalf of the group. Um, now, I have had people both online and face-to-face -face tell me that a um, AA group cannot uh, actually function because they don't have a loving God expressing himself in the group conscience. But the problem with that is if you read this tradition, it says a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience, which means that there are times that God may not express itself in the group conscience. So if God doesn't always express himself in the group conscience, does the group conscience still apply? I think that it does. So the, the God is optional here. He may express himself. He may not. So for me as an atheist, God never expresses himself in the group conscience. It's the group conscience that decides what to do. And our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. So those trusted servants of our groups, they don't tell us what to do. We ask them to do, and they do for the group. It's service. And that's how I understand that tradition. So if I were to write this, I would just leave out the God part. I would say for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Very simple. So I'm going to go ahead and start reading now, and I will stop in places uh, where I have a thought and comment. And again, I do hope to hear from you as well. So here it goes. Where does AA get its direction? Who runs it? This too is a puzzler for every friend and newcomer. When told that our society has no president having authority to govern it, no treasurer who can compel the payment of any dues, no board of directors who can cast an erring member into outer darkness, when indeed no AA can give another a directive and enforce obedience, our friends gasp and exclaim, this simply can't be. There must be an angle somewhere. These practical folk then read tradition too and learn that the sole authority of AA or NAA is a loving God as he may express himself in the group conscience. They dubiously ask an experienced AA member if this really works. The member saying to all appearances immediately answers, yes, it definitely works. The friends mutter that this looks vague, nebulous, pet pretty naive to them. Then they commence to watch us with speculative eyes, pick up a fragment of AA history and soon have the solid facts. So again, I do like the idea that there is no other AA member who can compel an, a, another AA member to believe or do a certain thing. We are free as individuals to do as we wish. Uh, there, there is no top-down organization in AA as is always made clear throughout the traditions and every place else in AA. This is a bottom-up organization. So what are these facts of AA life which brought us to this apparent impractical principle? 
I don't think it's impractical at all. This is very practical. Uh, now, I guess it would be impractical if you think there's a loving God that's directing everything. But if it's the group conscience, if it's the group making decisions uh, for for the benefit of the group, then um, that's very practical as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, uh, they're thinking it's impractical here. So John Doe, a good AA, moves, let us say, to Middletown, USA. Alone now, he reflects that he may not be able to stay sober or even alive unless he passes on to other alcoholics what was so freely given to him. He feels a spiritual and ethical compulsion because hundreds may be suffering within reach of his help. Then, too, he misses his home group. He needs other alcoholics as much as they need him. He visits preachers, doctors, editors, policemen, and bartenders, with the result that Middletown now has a group, and he is the founder. A great experience to found an AA group. Um, I was able to do that here in Kansas City uh, when I when we started the We Agnostics group, and it's been an amazing experience. And I can relate to some of what uh, they write about that in this tradition. So being the founder, he is at first the boss. Who else could be? Very soon, though, his assumed authority to run everything begins to be shared with the first alcoholics he has helped. At this moment, the benign dictator becomes chairman of a committee composed of his friends. These are the growing group's hierarchy of service, self-appointed, of course, because there is no other way. In a matter of months, AA booms in Middletown. So yeah, that's that's how it works. Uh, you know, when our group started here in KC, it was just me and Jim. We're the only two there. We decided what we wanted to um, do. You know, we created a format for the group. Um, we did decide that we are going to have quarterly business meetings so that the group could eventually start making the decisions on behalf of the group. And we've done that. We've had quarterly business meetings um, ever since the group started. Now, um, since COVID, that hasn't happened because we've gone online and the group is a little bit different now. But uh, pre-COVID, we met quarterly and the group decided what it was going to do. The founder and his friends channel spirituality to newcomers, hire halls, make hospital arrangements, and entreat their wives to brew gallons of coffee. Eh, a little bit dated there, isn't it? Being on the human side, the founder and his friends may bask a little in glory. They say to one another, perhaps it would be a good idea if we continue to, to continue to keep a firm hand on AA in this town. After all, we are experienced. Besides, look at all the good we've done these drunks. They should be grateful. True, founders and their friends are sometimes wiser and more humble than this, but more often at this stage, they are not. Interesting. I don't think that Jim and I ever got to that stage where we thought that we should be the ones who always decide what to do for the group. Um, I think that we, well, because we had already been in AA for a long time, we knew better. We knew that the group had to decide what to do. And uh, so we never tried to, you know, force our will on the group. Um, I guess we were a little bit more humble than, than these people. But anyway, growing pains now beset the group. Panhandlers panhandle, lonely hearts pine, problems descend like an avalanche. Still, more important, murmurs are heard in the body politic, which swell into a loud cry. Do these old timers think they can run this group forever? Let's have an election. The founder and his friends are hurt and depressed. They rush from one crisis and from member to member. They, they rush from crisis to crisis and from member to member, pleading, but it's no use. The revolution is on. The group conscience is about to take over. So, uh, yeah, you know, this, this um, was not an issue at our group. Um, we were happy to turn things over to the group. The problem that we had is that the, the members of the group were reluctant to take on any of the responsibility. You know, um, we were fortunate that we had a GSR for our group for um, three terms. You know, we had different, uh, three different GSRs, which was great. But after the third one's term came up, we couldn't get another. Um, you know, we, we, we had representation at the central office. A person took up that responsibility for a while, but after she, her term was over, no one else wanted to take her place. Um, it was very difficult to get anybody to volunteer to be a treasurer. Um, 
it was just, you know, it's really difficult to get anybody to do anything other than to volunteer to chair meetings. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that's all the group needs. So, you know, we have a bank account and we do have a treasurer now and the group supports itself through its own contributions. And the people who chair the meetings decide the, how, what's going to be um, done at that meeting. So that's how things are done. But uh, yeah, the, the problem that we had was, was the difficulty with getting people to want to um, become trusted servants. But we did have a group conscience. There's no doubt about that. We met quarterly and the group decided what it wanted to do. Now comes the election. If the founder and his friends have served well, they may, to their surprise, be reinstated for a time. If, however, they may be summarily beached, in either case, oh, let's see. If, however, they have heavily resisted the rising tide of democracy, they may be summarily beached. In either case, the group now has a so-called rotating committee, very sharply limited in its authority, and no sense whatever can its members govern or direct the group. They are servants. Theirs is the sometimes thankless privilege of doing the group's chores. Headed by the chairman, they look after public relations. Public relations talked about quite a bit in the traditions. Like they were really concerned about that in the early days. I imagine that they were. But headed by the chairman, they look after public relations and arrange meetings. Their treasurer, strict, strictly accountable, takes money from the hat that is passed. Banks it, pays the rent and other bills, and makes a regular report at business meetings. The secretary sees that literature is on the table, looks after the phone answering service, answers the mail, and sends out notices of meetings. Such are the simple services that enable the group to function. The committee gives no spiritual advice, of course not, judges no one's conduct, issues no orders. Every one of them may be promptly eliminated at the next election if they try this. And so they make the belated discovery that they are really servants, not senators. These are universal experiences. Thus, throughout AA does the group conscience decree the terms upon which its leaders shall serve. And that's the truth. It's always been my experience. The group conscience, uh, the group decides what <laughs> the group runs things and you know, I, I do like how in this paragraph it spells out some of the simple functions, you know, a chairman, um, a treasurer, a secretary. Um, these are the office. These are the trusted servants positions that we tried to have for our group, too, just to kind of keep it really simple. Now, I know that there is an AA pamphlet called I think it's called the AA group where it lists specifically the how a group can be set up in the different um, um, positions. This brings up. This brings us straight to the question, does AA have a real leadership? Most emphatically, the answer is yes, notwithstanding the apparent lack of it. Let's turn again to the deposed founder and his friends. What becomes of them? As their grief and anxiety wear, a subtle change begins. Ultimately, they divide into two classes known in AA slang as elder statesmen and bleeding deacons. And I've seen this, you know, the elder statesmen are the, are the people that I see at our area assembly. These are past delegates who come up to every assembly and help us by sharing uh, information with us about what has happened in the past and how things have been done in the past. Uh, they're very wise and considerate and they, um, you know, comfort, they give us some comfort that maybe we are on the right path. The bleeding deacons are the people who pout because things aren't being done their way who claim that things were done better in the old days and um, are kind of resentful. So anyway, the elder statesman is the one who sees the wisdom of the group's decision, who holds no resentment over his reduced status, whose judgment fortified by considerable experience is sound, and who is willing to sit quietly on the sidelines, patiently awaiting developments. The bleeding deacon is one who is just as surely convinced that the group cannot get along without him, who can who constantly connives for re-election to office, and who continues to be consumed with self-pity. A few hemorrhage so badly that, drained of all AA spirit and principle, they get drunk. At times, the AA landscape seems to be littered with bleeding forms. Nearly every old-timer in our society has gone through this process in some degree. Happily, most of them survive and live to become elder statesmen. They become the real and permanent leadership of AA. 
Theirs is the quiet opinion, the sure knowledge and humble example that resolve a crisis. When sorely perplexed, the group inevitably turns to them for advice. They become the voice of the group conscience. In fact, these are the true these are the true voice of Alcoholics Anonymous. They do not drive by mandate, they lead by example. This is the experience which has led us to the conclusion that our group conscience, well advised by its elders, will be in the long run wiser than any single leader. Interesting. So the group conscience here is well advised by elders. No God is interfering here um, with guiding it in any way. It's the people in the room, obviously. So that's something we can point out to the believers who say that an AA group can't function without a God. Anyway, when AA was only three years old, an event occurred demonstrating this principle. And I don't know if this is such a great example. I, anyway, this is when Bill was given a, an opportunity to work as a lay therapist at the treatment center, the town's hospital, and he turned it down because the group didn't want him to do it. But we'll talk about there as, as we read through it. When AA was only three years old, an event occurred demonstrating this principle. One of the first members of AA, actually the first, entirely contrary to his own desires, was obliged to conform to group opinion. Here is the story in his words. One day I was doing a 12-step job at a hospital in New York. The proprietor, Charlie, summoned me to his office. Bill, he said, I think it's a shame that you are financially so hard up. All around you, these drunks are getting well and making money. But you're giving this work full time and you're broke. It isn't fair. Charlie finished in his desk and came up with an old financial statement. Handing it to me, he continued, This shows the kind of money the hospital used to be making back in the 1920s. Thousands of dollars a month. It should be doing just as well now, and it would if only you'd help me. So why don't you move your work in here? I'll give you an office, a decent drawing account, and a very healthy slice of the profits. Three years ago, when my head doctor, Silkworth, began to tell me of the idea of helping drunks by spirituality, I thought it was a crackpot. I thought it was crackpot stuff. But I've changed my mind. Someday this bunch of ex-drunks of yours will fill Madison Square Garden. And it turns out I think it did. And I don't see why you should starve meanwhile. What I propose is perfectly eth ethical. You can become a lay therapist and more successful than anybody in the business. Now, there are plenty of AA members who go to work in treatment centers, and there's no conflict whatsoever. There's no violation of the traditions. Everything's fine. Now, I think the difference is here um, that this is the beginning of AA. You know, it's, it's not quite yet on its legs. We don't actually have traditions in place. Um, and... I, the group, and we'll read about this later, the group is concerned that if Bill goes working for this hospital and gets his um, recovery of helping other alcoholics by getting paid for it at the hospital, he's not going to be putting his energy and time into Alcoholics Anonymous and growing the fellowship. And that's probably true. I mean, think about it. If Bill had gone to work at Towns Hospital and started making money, and had the benefit of helping other alcoholics, he wouldn't have had to do any of the other work that goes that went into building this fellowship and making what it is today. So, anyway, continued. I was bowled over. There were a few twinges of conscience until I saw how really ethical Charlie's proposal was. There was nothing wrong, whatever, with becoming a lay therapist. I thought of Lois as coming home exhausted from the department store each day, only to cook supper for a house full of drunks who weren't paying board. I thought of the large sum of money still owing my Wall Street creditors. I thought of a few of my alcoholic friends who also were making as much money as ever. Why shouldn't I do as well as they? Although I asked Charlie for a little time to consider it, my own mind was about made up. Racing back to Brooklyn on the subway, I had a seeming flash of divine guidance. It was only a single sentence, but most convincing. In fact, it came right out of the Bible. A voice kept saying to me, the laborer is worthy of his hire. Arriving home, I found Lois cooking as usual while three drunks looked hungrily on from the kitchen door. I drew her aside and told, the glorious, told her the glorious news. She looked interested, but not as excited as I thought she should be. It was meeting night. 
Although none of the alcoholics we boarded seemed to get sober, some others had. With their wives, they crowded into our downstairs parlor. I think it's interesting. Those early meetings included the alcoholic and their spouses. At once, I burst into the story of my opportunity. Never shall I forget their impassive faces and the steady gaze they focused upon me. With waning enthusiasm, my tail trailed off to the end. There was a long silence. Almost timidly, one of my friends began to speak. We know how hard up you are, Bill. It bothers us a lot. We've often wondered what we might do about it. But I think I speak for everyone here when I say that what you now propose bothers us an awful lot more. The speaker's voice grew more confident. Don't you realize, he went on, that you can never become a professional? As generous as Charlie has been to us, don't you see that we can't tie this thing up with this hospital or any other? You tell us that Charlie's proposal is ethical. Sure, it's ethical. But what we've got won't run on ethics only. It has to be better. Sure, Charlie's idea is good, but it isn't good enough. This is a matter of life and death, Bill, and nothing but the very best will do. Challengingly, my friends looked upon me as their spokesman continued. Bill, haven't you often said right here in this meeting that sometimes the good is the enemy of the best? Well, this is a plain case of it. You can't do this thing to us. So spoke the group conscience. The group was right and I was wrong. The voice on the subway was not the voice of God. <laughs> so interesting. Here was the, the true voice welling up out of my friends. I listened and thank God I obeyed. So funny that the tradition says that the group conscience um, is a loving God expresses himself to the group conscience, but throughout the tradition, when you read it, God has nothing to do with it. In fact, what he thought was God was not. And so it's just, it's just crazy. But anyway, so it does make sense, I guess, for Bill at that time. You know, the, the group was, the group saw this not just as Bill getting a job in a treatment center. It was Alcoholics Anonymous becoming entwined, I guess, with this um, treatment center, with Bill's hospital and with Bill becoming so devoted to that work that he would not spend the time with AA and building AA. So that's probably true. So the group conscience was, you know what? You you really need to spend your time here um, with this because we have something special here. And it goes beyond your work um, and how ethical it may be. Uh, we need you here, Bill Wilson. And he stayed and he ended up building Alcoholics Anonymous. So that's tradition two. Again, it's all about how the group conscience decides what the group will do for the benefit of the group. The, the, the leaders of the group really aren't leaders. They're trusted servants. They do as the group asks them to do. So next week, we're going to be going into tradition three. And that's one of my favorite traditions. It's one of the best traditions for us um, agnostics and atheists in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the tradition that says that the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. When I saw that tradition hanging on the wall, it gave me hope. And I'm looking forward to talking about that one. So until then, you guys, uh, thank you very much once again for your support on Patreon and through YouTube. I really do appreciate it. It helps out quite a bit. Um, I cannot tell you how much um, help that is. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll be back again next week. Bye-bye.